everyone Today i want to talk about a myth that is that having more data is better for your machine learning model and this is absolutely wrong i'm going to talk about variable importance or as americans say less is more so let's go back to this example if you remember we have just one feature x1 it could be the concentration of a drug and then we have this categorical variable that can take a couple of values no and yes Remember that in, in, re in, in ideal life, we don't have any overlap, but in real life, we have these sort of things in which we have some region with uncertainty. We use a neural network with a large number of neurons. In this case, just five will do the job. We have something weird like this, and this is the prediction of the model. And the problem with that prediction is that probably it's trying to fit this part here. You have some gaps in the data in this part and, and maybe we have some neurons specialized in this part of the job. So this is simply wrong. So what can we do in order to understand the problem of overfitting when we have a larger number of variables? So let's take that data set and let's include a new variable. This variable is going to be absolutely uninformative because actually it's pure noise. So let's create this variable x2. If you plot this you can see that x1 is like a step function. We have for low values we have a no, for large values we have a yes, and we have some fuzzy region in, in, in the middle. But for x2 everything is more or less the same. So of course x2 should be completely irrelevant for the fitting. And you could say, okay, maybe it's irrelevant, but I don't know, it's not making any damage. But that's not true. So let's take a carrot and let's fit a neural network with a variable number of neurons and a variable value of the decay rate of the penalty that we introduce in training. So if you use cross-validation for this fake data, data set, you see that the optimal number of neurons in the hidden layer is 3 and the optimal decay rate is 10 to the minus 4. Okay, so far so good. I want to, to show you something. This looks pretty much like the, the training that we did in the previous video, but as you can see here, we, the rate of, of vari variability is more or less the same. So here is even narrower, so the accuracy is more or less the same for the worst model and for the best model. This means that here, increasing the number of hidden uh, units, we are increasing unnecessarily the complexity of the model. And one thing is saying that this is unnecessary, and the other thing is saying that this is dangerous. So let me show you how this is dangerous. So let's take our data. And some guys did this study, so they take... They took uh, different data sets and, and, and took different techniques and they were increasing the number of additional non-informative predictors. So they did basically the same as I've done before, but instead of using one variable called x2, they introduced 10, 20, 100, up to 500 values. You could say, okay, this is a huge number of variables, but in big data pro problems, this is not that large. So this is the summary of their conclusions. So interestingly, neural networks are very vulnerable to the number of non-informative predictors. And that makes sense if you understand how uh, net neural networks are trained. If you remember, basically we are exploring this landscape, defining a multidimensional space in which each dimension is related to weight. So if you have tons of weights, you're going to have uh, tons of valleys, which are spurious, are not very relevant, but you are going to train that network and it's going to be cracked. And as you can see here, the, the larger the number of uh, stupid uh, features that you're introducing, the more useless is your, your value. Higher or less is worse because this is uh, the root mean square. Okay. What about classification? In this case, the authors try a couple of models, trees and random forests. And as you can see here, trees perform really poorly in general. And, and the good thing with random forests is that they perform better. That's one good thing. But the other thing is that they are very robust to, to the number of new features. So random forests uh, are very robust and in the sense that they are good at telling what, what variables are good and what variables are uh, nonsense. And there is one reason why. If you go back to the video on random forests, we were doing a couple of things. The, the first thing was bugging, and bugging meant that we were shuffling the data in order to train a collection, an ensemble of different trees. But the other thing that Random Forest did was that instead of using all the variables, they were, ju they were just using those variables according to a, a random number. So for instance, here you could have 500 variables, but in the Random Forest, at each step of the tree, 
using 500, maybe using the square root of 500 or something which you can measure by cross-validation. But the good thing is that in, in the second part of the algorithm in which you are voting and you're applying the majority rule, only those forests that are using the, the relevant variables are going to be consistent in the predictions. And this is why random forests are so robust and so popular these days. So, we could wrap up this video with this question. So, is there a way, a systematic way, to tell if X2 is actually relevant? Because the problem is that all the metrics that we have used so far to compare models, like the confusion matrix and the area under the curve, for instance, are not going to discriminate between a good model and a bad model. And this is the, the comparison between the logistic regression and that neural, neural network that we train using that fake variable. And actually you could have a, the bad impression that maybe having more neurons and having X2 is better than the simple model with logistic regression. This is completely false. So there are a couple of things that you can do. And the first thing is use your brain or use your eyes. Imagine that this is a training network, this one that we have, have uh, determined using cross-validation. If you take a look at the weights here in red, you can see that the weights coming from, the, from X2 are actually narrower than the weights coming from X1. So this is a way to tell that this this variable is irrelevant. But remember, there are a couple of questions, different questions. One question is which model is more accurate, and maybe this model is more accurate. And the other is w what method is capturing what variables are relevant. So here neural networks are capturing that irrelevancy, but not using this. So the first idea is trust your eyes. But actually we don't need a fancy neural network to do that. So we can go back, and using the, the good the good old box plot or the histogram. And as you can see here, when you compare the variability of X2 according to no and yes, and the variability of X1 according to no and yes, and you can see this in, in this couple of plots, you can see that X1 is informative because you can distinguish these colors pretty much in, in different in these classes, but you cannot do that with X2. So trust your eyes because sometimes this phase of exploratory data analysis is so important that you can discriminate without using any fancy algorithm. You can also use basic correlations. So one way to do that is using this function filter var imp var variable importance in caret. So here remember that my second variable is y. So I'm, I'm saying that x is everything except the second variable and y is only the second variable. And as you can see here, just computing correlations, you're capturing that x1 is important and x2 is completely irrelevant. And this is of course in, uh, seen in this graph. So x1 is the, the average value of x1 for the reds is more or less here. The average value of x1 for the blues is more or less here. But you cannot tell that with x2. More problems. What if uh, we multiply x2 by 100? Instead of using 0, 1, we said 0, 100. Remember that in backpropagation, the, the first step is using initial random weights. And what if, because of this, I'm amplifying the effect of x2 and I'm falling into the basin of attraction of one of those, um, those initial values? Let's see what happens. So let's train neural networks. And as you can see here, again, we have some problems. One problem is that actually because of this, we are shifting not only the importance of X2, but also the number of hidden layers, uh, hidden neurons in the hidden layer, uh, in order to reproduce, uh, to have higher accuracy values. So again, higher complexity and it's a necessary complexity. So this is an, another study. This is a uh, a study with neural networks trying to feed E equals X squared using different values. And as you can see here, non-standard dice in the inputs produces a very l slow convergence. And if you stop here, actually uh, the algorithm even converts. So one very simple tip is in order to reduce maximizing the effect of random initial conditions, uh, you should uh, standardize the input or, or change the, the range of variability of the input from 0 to 1 for all the numerical variables. Okay, tip number three, in, in for some algorithms, caret provides this variable, which is called this function called variable importance. And this only works for generalized linear models like logistic regression and, and of course traditional regression. Random forest because of that, because we are using just m, m variables out of the total number of variables. So when we apply this majority rule, we are selecting those trees which are relevant and all the things related to trees like decision trees, of course, because at each step of, of the decision, we are giving some importance to that 
variable that we're using in the branch and all the derivatives of decision trees like back trees, boost trees and so on and so forth. Okay? The problem is that overfitting can mess up variable importance. So neural networks have some sort of variable importance implemented, but it can be misleading. So let me show you an example. If you take logistic regression or, or, or the neural network with just one neuron, you can see that he's performing pretty well. So he's telling that uh, the importance of x1 with respect to x2 is, I would say, like uh, 30 to 1. Okay. But if you do that with a neural network with uh, three neurons in the hidden layer, the importance is only 2 to 1. So this means that because of that overfitting, uh, this neural network is saying that x2 is relevant when actually it isn't. Okay, so be careful with neural networks. But, okay, this is my message. Tip number three, when the algorithm allows for that, use variable importance to, to see that. Okay, here you have a list of, of all the methods of caret that implement that. You can see that the link to that list in the description. And in particular, we have random uh, forests and decision trees. So if you do that uh, using those models, you can see that actually they are very good uh, capturing that x2 is irrelevant. And actually, there is a good agreement between both methods. OK, tip number four. There are some fancy ways of doing correlations. So the, the problem with correlations is that they are just correlating one input with one output. But sometimes there is some sort of synergy between, between features. And sensitivity analysis can't do that. So sensitivity analysis, according to Wikipedia, is something like trying to estimate how the uncertainty of the output is related to the uncertainty of the input. Mathematically, it's like computing the partial derivative of the output with respect to each input when we are setting the other ones to a constant, so this is fixing the other parameters there. This is very hard to do for black box models, but, mm, but you can do this numerically. And this is a, a library created by people at my university and after the PhD thesis of my, my colleague Antonio Muñoz. And the idea is the following. So take different, uh, take different values, fix all of them except one, plug different numbers here and compute the output and the input and compute the sensitivity. And the good thing is that as you are plugging a lot of numbers here and, and a lot of numbers there for, for in it at each step, you're not getting just one sensitivity, but a, hist uh, a histogram, a distribution of sensitivity. So let me show you the output. Let's take this good old friend of us and let's add a new dummy variable. This x3 is something like pure noise in, in the same range of variability of one of them. Okay? And then compute the sensitivities. Okay? So this is the output of this function. This is the distribution that I was mentioning. This is not very easy to read. Here you have some ideas. The, the sign here is giving you the mean sensitivity. So x2 looks like that it's very uh, highly sensitive, but negatively is, uh, related to the variable. But again, if you don't want to, to mess up with these plots, this is the best, the most important one. So this is a summary of the relative importance of the variables. And as you can see here, the method is really good because it's saying that the sensitivity of this noise is zero, which is actually what we want to do. OK. Let's try to do that with our data set. Then remember, x1 was important, x2 is pure noise. And as you can see here, this library works pretty smoothly because it's detecting that x2 doesn't, doesn't uh, provide any new information. So tip number four, use sensitivity analysis and similar methods for, for all methods. So what can we do with non-important features? So we have somehow uh, dissected what are the main methods to see when a feature is important or not. So I'm going to give you in the next video an automatic way to do that.